Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the letter written by James, chapter 5, the last eight verses. Chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, Elijah prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God truly stands forever. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, with our Bibles open uh, and our ears attentive, we, we come not to hear the words of a person, uh, but to hear from you. And so, Father, we pray that that would be the case today, that as we reflect on this scripture passage, as we talk about what it means to pray effectively, we pray that, uh, that you would speak, that we would hear your voice, that those things that are not from you would fade away in our minds and that you would impress on us what we need to hear from you today. Father, your children are listening. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So a couple weeks ago, we began talking about a new vision, a new vision for Hopkins Community Church, uh, a vision in which we are boldly bringing, over the next seven years, the good news of Jesus Christ to every household in the greater Hopkins community. And that we're doing that through uh, effective prayer, through, uh, I'm sorry, expectant prayer, effective evangelism, and radical obedience to the Holy Spirit. This is a big vision. And it's going to be unfolding before us as we continue to move on through the weeks and months of this year, as we work towards our one-year goal in this seven-year vision of visiting every household in the Hopkins community and asking them two questions. How can we pray for you, and how can we serve you? And we're endeavoring to do this to get to know them, get to know our neighbors, because the reality for us is that we, we don't know our neighbors very well. We, we, it, is, it is Hopkins, so we, we have this kind of general understanding that everybody knows everybody, yeah? Like, you can't really do anything in Hopkins without somebody finding out and telling everybody about it at CDs, right? Uh, I actually, I, <laughs> I went down, yeah, yesterday, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I went and dropped off a package at the UPS thing, uh, thinking they would come and pick it up, but it was Saturday, and they didn't. Um, so I went back a little bit later to pick up the package and then I went to CDs and told Chris, I said, hey, if anybody comes in talking about the pastor stealing UPS packages, just let him know I was reclaiming what's mine, not stealing somebody else's stuff, right? It's Hopkins. We have this sense of, 
Uh, everybody kind of knows everybody. But the reality is, is that's not actually true. And that we as a church don't necessarily know everybody either. And so our first year goal is actually not one of uh, pounding down people's doors and hitting them with the Bible as much as it is getting to know them and look, figuring out, learning together how we can be the hands and the feet of Christ here in the village of Hopkins. So with that in mind, uh, this big picture of vision over the next seven years, we've been unpacking now. For, we're, uh, we, we started last week and, or two weeks ago, and we're going to continue to unpack that over the next couple of months. What does it mean to pray expectantly, we talked about last week. And we also talked about the fact that all of the adjectives in that sentence, the uh, expectant, effective, and radical, could actually be applied to all three of the nouns, prayer, evangelism, and obedience. So it's expectant prayer, effective prayer, radical prayer, uh, and effect, expectant uh, evangelism. Right? We, we, we're telling people about Jesus, expecting that the Spirit's going to do something with that, not that we're just kind of you know, blabbing about something, but that we're, we're going expectantly, that we're going to do it effectively. We're going to actually be able to articulate our faith, and we're going to do it radically. We're not going to cower behind our, our doors or our houses or whatever and, and, and be scared that people might call us names or think that we look funny, right? We're going to do it radically. We're going to bring the good news, the hope, the truth, the life, right? That's what Jesus is, the way, the truth, the life. He is the only hope, and we're going to bring that to people, and we're going to do it obediently, expectant obedience, that we should, as the people of God, expect that the Holy Spirit is going to do something and tell us to do something, and that, that when we follow the Holy Spirit, it, we, we should expect that he's going to do something through us, and we're going to do that effectively by learning how to listen to the Holy Spirit and by learning how to obey without delay right away. That's what we, call, that's what we tell our kids, right? And if I say you need to do something, and I is shaking her head back there right now. Obey right away without delay because it's important that when the Holy Spirit says, hey, go talk to that person, that you go and talk to that person and that we don't talk ourselves out of it. There's a book called The 10-Second Rule. Right? The, the idea is that if you don't do something, that if the Spirit prompts you, like let's just say you're driving down the road, you see somebody pulled off the side, they got their flashers on, and you have maybe 10 seconds before you pass them. And in that 10 seconds, you will do everything in your power to talk yourself out of stopping. Right? Yeah. Right? And so the book, The 10-Second Rule, the idea is pre-decide. If you see somebody on the side of the road with a flashers on, and you can help, right? If I stop by, and I was like, oh, looks like, yeah, looks like your car's not working, right? But, but you can stop and be like, hey, do you have a phone? Do you need to call someone, right? If you can stop and you can help, stop and help, right? Decide in advance, that if the Spirit says, go, you, you go, right? Effective and radical obedience. When the Spirit says to do things, like if the Spirit calls you to pray, this isn't really radical for, for Christians, but it kind of feels that way sometimes. Like if the Spirit says, hey, you need to pray for that person right now? Do you do it? I don't, right? So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about all of that. And we're unpacking that over the, over the next several months of what it means to be a, a, a praying congregation, what it means to be an evangelistic con congregation, what it means to be an obedient congregation. So all that to say, we are in the midst of uh, talking about prayer. Last week we talked about expectant prayer, that when we come to God, we do it intentionally and we do it expectantly because God is God, first of all, and, and so he is able to do uh, the things that, that he says he can do. And when we come before him, we should come expecting that God is going to, to hear us, expecting that God is going to act on our behalf. That's, that's something that, that scripture says, when you ask for anything in my name, I will do it for you. Now, there's a lot of caveats to that, and we talked about that last week. You can check that out online if you want. Um, but the reality is, is that when, when we pray, and, and we're, we're praying after the will of God because our hearts are aligned with God, what we see is that we pray into God's will, and we pray expecting that God is going to move and do something. We pray for healing, expecting that God is going to be healed. We don't say, God, it'd be nice if you did this. We say, God, it is your desire that people aren't burdened by the sickness and illness that is caused by sin in the world. And so we pray, God, that you would bring healing. And then we expect that he's going to do it, right? This is kind of like faith in action, really what it is. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's almost like putting our money where our mouth is in some sense, where we are praying 
into what we know God is able to do, and we just have to get past our sort of, like, uh, this, is, this is, okay, what I'm about to say has a lot of baggage with it, but we have to get past our scientific worldview where it's like, it's this or this, and we have to, we have to go to God, the one who created everything, and say, God, you can do this. Like, we know you can do this. And we got to get past that mental block of saying it's just not possible. Or, or, or uh, we, you know, whatever that is. We have to get past that Western worldview of, of black and white and, and, and like, oh, they're sick so they're going to die. And say, no, God, God can do this and pray into that. And today, today, we're looking at, I would say, that plus effective prayer. What is effective prayer? prayer. And if last week we talked about expectant prayer, which I would actually consider to be almost more like intentional prayer, where we actually think about what we're praying and we don't just pray off rote prayers. Right? Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, you realize we teach our kids these things, right? If I die before I wake, I pray my uh, Lord my soul to take. And you, your kids go, what does that mean? Yes. Time for some theology. That's what happens at our house. Uh, right? <laughs> we, not just praying off rote prayers and things that we don't think about, but praying intentionally and expectantly, thinking about what we ask God for, thinking about what we're praying into. An effective prayer, which I also would consider to be maybe consistent prayer. Because what James reveals to us, I think very clearly here, is that effective prayer is contingent on having a regular, consistent prayer life in a life that's aligned rightly with God. So let's unpack that for a few minutes. First of all, beginning, James 5, verse 13, he says, Is any one of you in trouble? What should you do? I know it's cold outside but it is at least 70 degrees in here. So we're going to need to, uh, maybe you're just getting over the walk inside. So if any one of you is in trouble, he should or he, she should. Pray. Thank you. That's really good, right? Trouble literally means, the word trouble literally means suffering or enduring hardship or experiencing trouble. It's a very generalized word to say, hey, if something's not going right in your life right now, what should you do? Pray, right? What, uh, is any one of you happy, right? Cheerful, uh, keeping up your, your good spirits. Is any one of you having a good, a good time, a good day, a good whatever in your life right now? You have a good thing. What should you do? You should sing songs of praise. What also, you could also translate that as saying you should pray, right? You should glorify God for what is going on, right? How many of us are really good at going to God when we're in trouble, Right? We have this adage, right? If all else fails, pray. Think about that for a second. Probably shouldn't be that way. Probably should be the other way around, right? Before all else, pray, right? Not when all else fails, pray, like God's the last resort that we go to, but in all things, pray. If you are in trouble, you should pray. If you are happy, if you're having a good day, this is actually the harder one of the two, you should sing songs of praise and glorify God in your, in your life, whether that is singing or praying or whatever it is. They're, they're kind of, you know, when, when you have that moment with God, it's, you know, it's not like, dear Lord, thank you for a good day. Amen. Right? It's like, hey, if you're worshiping in the car and you're just having that moment with God where, hey, you're having a good day and the song hits you and you're just going for it, right? That's, that's kind of part of your prayer life. You're, you're having, you're spending time, you're communing with God, you're feeling that, that relationship there, and you're glorifying him for what's going on. Is any one of you sick? You're literally, literally this word means weakened or disabled. And the, the inflection is like, right, not just if you have COVID, right, or if you have the flu, or if you have cancer, like is any one of you afflicted in any way? This goes on way past the idea of what a bacteria or a virus can cause in your body to things that you might be dealing with in your lives. Are you dealing with addiction? Are you dealing with uh, some sort of oppression in your lives? Are you dealing with something that is, is causing great distress or great 
uh, weak, kind of a weakened, disabled state in your lives. There, there's, there's a lot of things that is going, like depression could go into this. All of the isms could be lumped, in, lumped into this. There's so much going on there. Is any one of you sick, weakened, disabled, whatever, you should pray, right? Pray. And there's more to it than that. We'll unpack that in a second. But the reality for us is that prayer... Prayer is communion and conversation with God. It's fellowship with Him. It's talking with Him. It's being with Him in some way, shape, or form where we are speaking and actually where we are listening as well. And it doesn't have to come in this sort of formalized only at mealtime or before bed sort of thing. Think about it this way. Every, well, we're trying to do this. Every day when I come home, uh, there is at least a minute or two where I connect with my wife. And we talk about, (laughs) we talk about our day. So she's being accosted by a stuffed pig right now. So, uh, (laughs) and so I get home and and I, we, we connect. How was your day? What's going on, right? We don't just do this when it's a good day. It's like, how was your day? Oh, it was great. I walk in. How was your day? <clears throat> right? Sometimes it feels that way. But the reality is, right, we connect. And we, we have an intentional connection point when I come home from work. And it happens regardless of what she's feeling. It's happening regardless of what I'm feeling. It may not be the most enjoyable moment of our day, but it is a connection point for us. We talk about what happened that was good. We talked about what happened that is bad. We talked about all of the things that are, that are whatever's going on, right? There's, there's a connection there. Maybe you have something similar with your spouse or with, with your family, your parents, a loved one, friends, whatever, right? You have connection points where you talk about things. You don't just talk about good things, right? If you experience life with rosy colored glasses and all you talk about is good things but you don't ever talk to anybody when it's bad right that wouldn't work out very well and vice versa your relationship probably wouldn't go very well if the only thing you shared with your loved ones was the bad things right you just complain 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 all the time that doesn't really help relationships that much either you talk you communicate with your loved ones on a regular basis and when you do so your 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 relationship grows it deepens right over time imagine if the opposite were true imagine if you didn't have a regular communication time with your spouse imagine it or or with your with your family with your loved ones how i mean right choose any relationship you want it doesn't really matter with your parents with your friends with your kids whatever if you don't have intentional connection points where you're talking, when you're listening, when you're communicating together, what happens to the relationship? Right? It starts to go downhill. You, you don't necessarily know what's going on in, 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 our, in each other's lives. You, you don't know what, what you're feeling or what they're feeling. You're not understanding. We don't know the plans that they have. Right? I come home with one plan and Bethany tells me what my plan is when I get there. And, right, that's how, <laughs> that's how it works. Actually, that's not true, usually. But um, uh, anyways, right, there's, there's all of this that goes into communication. And when it doesn't happen regularly, our relationships suffer. The, one of the, the single greatest cause of marital issues in life is poor communication. Because relationships take a nosedive when we aren't active and engaged in each other's lives. It's just a reality. Right? You start to think about this. What would happen if I was the only one in our relationship that was talking? Right? And, and, and I never gave Bethany a chance to talk. I just talked at her, talked at her, talked at her, talked at her, done. I'm on to the next thing, right? That doesn't really work out either. The sad thing about this, and maybe you can see where this analogy is going, the sad thing about this is that all of these sort of negative ideas about communication and relationships are probably better descriptors of our prayer life than the good ones. Right? And I'm just as guilty as this as anybody else. When do you pray? Go to bed, you say, God, thanks for this day, thanks for this. Done. 
right? I talk, I talk, I talk, I talk, and then I'm asleep, right? Or we pray at mealtime. We say, God, thank you for this food. Thank you for this day. Thank you for what da, 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 done. Amen. All right, on to the next thing, right? On to eating. Let's get, let's get this food. It's good. You know, it smells good. It's hot. We don't want to get, to get cold. And we don't spend time listening. We just say what we need to say and then move along. Right? The substance, the consistency, and really the, the reality of our prayer life is actually one of a fairly poor communication. Because we're always talking or we're always just doing it when things are bad. <laughs> or, quite frankly, we're inconsistent at best if we're doing it at all. And prayer is one of the foundational core components of our relationship with the Father. Jesus models it all throughout his ministry, very consistently, going away, being by himself, being with God, communing with God. Sometimes he does it all night long. And, 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 you know, but the reality is, is that we, we as followers, as, as children of God, we don't do that very well. But James points out we should, right? That the effective prayer life starts with a consistent prayer life. As I was, <laughs> this is interesting. I, sometimes, sometimes I have everything that I want to say and, I, and I'm like, I got this thing down. And then sometimes I get flashes of like images of things that happen and, 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 and analogies to this as, as we're, sometimes as we're worshiping or, or, you know, even just standing here. But I was thinking the other day, or I was thinking this morning about an event that happened the other day. And this is a fairly common event in our, in our lives uh, at, at my house. Um, there's a lot of talking that goes on at our house. Lots of talking, right? Uh, it, <laughs> Just go there, right? We have four girls. There's lots of talking. Lots of talking and lots of squawking. That's pretty much what, what happens at our house. Um, so much so that it almost, it becomes background noise. Legitimately becomes background noise for us. They're, right, right? Then one, you know, you only hear it when one voice starts to elevate a little bit and you're like, uh-oh, uh-oh, something's escalating. Then you tune back in and you're there, Right? Other than that, it's just kind of like, it's just stuff that's happening. And sometimes it becomes so much background noise that my daughter can be standing right next to me telling me a story, and I'm not even listening. She's trying to communicate something to me super important for her. I, you know, usually it's something about uh, a teddy bear or a doll or something that one of her sisters said or whatever, you know, whatever. It, it, it's like it's something happened. And she's trying to communicate this uber important thing to me, and I'm usually doing this. <laughs> or, or sometimes I'm just trying to tune out all of the noise, right? The reality is, though, that that is, that is sometimes, I think, the case. Uh, it, it, it happens, well, so it happens in reverse, too, where I'm trying to impress upon her, you know, a very important parental point, Right? And she is just not there. Like, you sit down, you stand in front of me, and she's like, you know, and they're like trying to hold on to her and whatever else. These, these sort of like, I, one of us is talking, the other one is just not listening sort of a thing. So, in the one hand, in this analogy, I think that oftentimes we tend to be like the daughter. We... We're hearing from God. God's trying to tell us something. He's trying to show us something. Maybe it's, it's, it's something through some hardship in our lives. Maybe it's like a direct line where God is just, he, he's speaking to you right now. And what are we doing? We're like, uh, uh, uh. you know, we got the phone out. We're doing this. We never have a quiet moment in our days or in our lives to actually sit down and listen to what God is saying to us or to, to hear from him at all. We, we just kind of go about our things and, and, and pray when it's consistent. But we also have this sort of idea that, uh, that sometimes we, we pray and God's not listening at all, right? They're talking, talk, 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 and, and God, it just feels like we're praying to an empty wall. The one tends to be true, that God is often speaking to us in our lives, and we tend to not be listening. 
but the other is never true. That when we are speaking to him, he's ignoring us. That is just plain not true. God is ready always to hear our prayers. God, the Holy Spirit, is praying for us when we don't even know what to pray for. Right? Romans 8 tells us that. So if you're in trouble, if you're happy, if you're sick, all of this, God says, pray. Bring it to me. I want to share that with you. Right? I want to be there for you. I want to be there with you in the hard times. I want you to be there with me in the hard times. And when you're happy, I want to hear about it too. Pray. And James goes on, right? If anyone of you is sick, you should pray. But there's some things that, that we're called to do too. Call the elders of the church to pray over you, right? You're anointed with oil and, and the whole bit. And, and a couple of things happen in there, right? Is any one of you sick? Verse 14, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So how does this work? Is any one of you sick? What, what should we do? Should we stay home and not tell anyone about it because we don't want to, you know, we're, we're private people, really private people. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, moaning and groaning and all this stuff. And so I just, well, I just won't tell them about it. And, you know, I'll just ask, you know, hope that God, you know, heals me or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And when I get better, I'll come back to church and everything will be fine. Nobody will be the wiser for it, right? I, I always love, I always love, you know, like, hey, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. What happened? Well, I had surgery. You what? Like, oh, well, I mean, everybody's entitled to their privacy. I totally get that. But the, the, the reality of what Scripture lays out for us is this sort of shared body experience. We are the body of Christ at Hopkins Community Church, and we are called to be together as the body, right? If you're sick, if you're sick, the Bible says, hey, Invite the body in to be a part of this healing process. Invite the body in because when we're praying together and we're praying for you, God is going to do something there, that God is going to be at work. It's like it, 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 if you were to break your arm, so you, let's just say you fall and break your arm. It's a relatively, uh, you know, something that happens apparently around here. So um, there's ice outside when you go out. Please don't be this analogy right now, okay? But if you were to, let's just say you were to slip on the ice, you were to fall, and you were to break your arm, what is the rest of your body going to do? Ignore it? Right? You're going to hold it. You're going to guard it. This is, it's called guarding. It's, it's a normal reflex for people. If you, seriously, if you are completely incapacitated, at, 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 like, on a, like if you're in a coma, and there's pain, your body does this. Like it always guards. It's a, it's a, it's a base reflex in your brain. And it, it's something that happens all the time. Like you have to be absolutely 100% brain dead for you to not do that. Right? It's just a normal function of your body. And so when you were, if you were to, let's say you fall and you break your arm, what are you going to do? The rest of your body is going to help hold that and help guard that until you go see a doctor and you get your splint, right? That's what you're going to do. You don't be like, oh, shake it off, arm, shake it off, and just walk away and hope for the best, right? You're like, hey, that, that hurts. Well, that's too bad. You shouldn't have been there, right? You don't do that. You don't do that in your own body. But what does is, what is 1 Corinthians 12 say? We are all members of one body. And in every body, there are many members, right? We're not all eyes, we're not all ears, we're not all noses, we're not all feet, da 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 we go on and go on and go on. But we're all members of one body. And as such, Scripture also says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Or in James it says, if you are sick, call the elders of the church. You could even say, call the Christian community, so that we can pray together with you and so that we can be a part of this healing process, inviting God into it. Why don't we do that? We're not embarrassed or we're, I don't know, we're, we're private people, but the reality is, right? The reality is that the more that we are isolated, 
the more the devil has room to play. Right? Isolation is the devil's playground. It really, really is. You tell me that you're not the most tempted to do things you know you shouldn't do when you're alone because no one else is there, right? That's when you are tempted to do the things, right? All the things. All of the things that you thought you had beaten. You, you're, you'd be home for a day by yourself and you'd see if the devil doesn't come and bring all that crap back up again, right? It happens, the same is true when we're sick and when we, we're in need of support and we isolate ourselves, right? That's when the devil goes to work. And I think that's why James says, hey, call the elders of the church. Call the church to be a part of this, right? The body of Christ. This, of all places in our lives, if we truly believe that this book is true, that we truly believe that the Holy Spirit is in us and in all of us, this should be the group of people that we call to share that burden. How do we pray? Well, when do we pray? First of all, we always pray. We pray all the time, right? Scripture says pray without ceasing. Bring it all to God. He wants to hear it. Right? He wants to be a part of that. How do we pray? We pray individually, right? Jesus says, go into your closet or, or, or go into the inner room. He says, this is, a, this is a private thing, right? There's this relationship that goes between you and me, and we need to spend time together. There is that component of it, right? We talked about that kind of last week. Jesus, in, in his teaching in Matthew 6, uh, you know, go into the, don't, you don't need to babble, and you don't need to do it publicly and all that stuff, but there's this you and me relationship that needs to be fostered, but there's also this Jesus and us, right? As Jesus loves the church, we are the bride of Christ, and Jesus wants to be a part of this. And the way that he becomes a part of this in many cases is when we are in it together. And for a lot of us, that means we have to take a step outside of our comfort zone and be willing to be vulnerable, be willing to be authentic about what it is that we're actually dealing with in our lives. And then invite people to step into it. There isn't usually a case, I would say, 99% of the time when we're going through something and we share it with a friend and they spend some time with us just listening, offering to pray, you never come out of that moment going, Man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Right? Man, I'm I'm so I'm I'm so upset with myself that I spent some time with this other person and they prayed for me. Right? No one does that. <laughs> this is funny. Even people that don't believe in Jesus, when you say, Hey, how can I pray for you? They'll give you something. Right? Why is that not true more for the church? For us as the body of Christ, who are called to be that one body. So moves on from here. Whew, time is flying. It moves on from here to verse 16. Now, this, this verse, this one verse is the, is the reason I chose this passage today. Because the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. And that verse sounded really good for a sermon about effective prayer, right? And I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to read a bunch of commentary on this verse, and we're going to learn the how of like, what, what exactly do we need to do? How exactly do we need to be so that we can have powerful, effective prayer, right? Everything I read, there's commentary in verse 14, there's commentary in verse 15, and there's commentary in verse 17, but not in verse 16. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. I'm going, Oh, come on. Like, come on. That was, this was going to be an easy one, right? That's what I thought. And, and so I started, I started looking at other aspects of that verse. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective, or has powerful effects. Well, before we talk about what it is that's effective, maybe we need to take a step back here today and talk about what it is to be righteous. Because it's the prayer of the righteous person that is powerful and effective. And Scripture is very, very clear, and commentaries are very, very clear about the word righteous. 
And it goes like this. Oh, not that. It goes like this. Romans 3, verse 21. But apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and all are justified freely or made righteous by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What is it to be righteous? The righteousness that we have doesn't mean it doesn't, yeah, yes, it's Jesus' righteousness. It doesn't mean that you have to learn the right words to pray or have the right incantations or whatever it is that is, is taught to you, right? That, that if you say the magic words, God is going to somehow listen and, and, and take care of it, right? If I, oh, you didn't say please, right? You didn't say the magic words, so God's not going to do anything about it. It says the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. The assumption is, is that what we're talking about here is prayer offered by believers. Prayer offered by those who are in Christ, who have Christ's righteousness imputed on them or inputted into their lives, right? There is no one righteous, no not one, except when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are made righteous in God's sight. Your relationship with God, which was broken when you were an enemy of God, when you were walking in darkness, when you were this old self, right? Completely disconnected from God. But in Jesus Christ, what happens? This is the good news of the gospel. When we believe in Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in him, what happens? That relationship is automatically healed. And for the first time in our lives in that moment, We have this new relationship and new self that we are living into. We are cleansed, healed, redeemed, renewed. We are a new creation. And scripture goes on and on and on about this, right? You were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him as Within, marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance and the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Right? We are made righteous. The Holy Spirit lives in us. God cannot be where sin is. And so when we believe in Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away and the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and lives in us forever. This is the, the most recent favorite verse, and our girls could sing it for you if they dared come up here. But the reality is this. When you are in Christ, anyone who is in Christ is a... What is it? Anyone who's in Christ is a... New creation. Oh, she's whispering. New creation. <laughs> new creation. The old is gone. The new has come because God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we in him might become the of God, right? We are made righteous in Christ, and the prayer of the person is powerful and effective. So the first thing, the first thing, friends, that we need to do is we need to be in right relationship with God, and the only way that happens is through Jesus Christ, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Right? He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness because by his wounds we are healed. We are made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? It is by grace you've been saved through faith. This not of yourselves, it is the gift of God and we are made righteous in that moment. We are made in right relationship with him. And this is what it assumes, right? The, the, the assumption here is that we are made aware of our sins, that we repent of our sins, that we turn from our old self and the power of the Holy Spirit, and by the grace of God, we are granted his righteousness, his gift of salvation in our lives. And you know what? 
That is a, it's a one-time transaction that happens where we turn from, we go from death to life, but you know as well as I do that it isn't a one-time thing where now we just don't sin anymore. The reality for us is that in our life of faith, as we're living in right relationship with God, it is a constant thing for us. It's a one-time thing for Jesus. He bore our sins once and for all, but we're still fighting that battle in our lives and in our hearts. And so the reality, and I think what James assumes here, is that the righteous person is one who is made right in Christ and who is living in a right relationship with God, which means we are always, always seeking to put off our old self and turn from our sins and, and, and leave all that stuff behind us and move forward in right relationship with God. It's a constant battle that we only fight in the power of the Holy Spirit. We only should fight it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we're doing that, we're in constant communion with God. We're in constant relationship with God because we know that we need God in all things. So that when we're sick, and when we're happy, and when we're suffering, we will pray. And we will always turn to God, always turn and look to him in all things. Right? Maybe it's not so much that good people are, uh, get their prayers heard better. But maybe it is that when we are in pursuit of Christ, we are in right relationship with him when we are constantly looking to him in all things, when we have this regular communion and uh, uh, regular conversation and communication with him, that we actually are the ones who are changed. That we begin to desire what God desires. That our hearts start looking more like God's heart that our minds start thinking the way that God wants us to think, that we start seeing things the way God sees them, and that the effect, the effective part of this effective prayer is actually a massive transformation of our lives, which then leads us along the path of God to be praying and working in others as well. Not in our own power, not in our own strength, but because of our dependence on God. And I think that this is also why James wraps the confession of sins and at the end of this, the turning of those who are wandering or those who are lost back to Christ or to Christ originally is all wrapped up in here because when we, when we have an effective prayer life, which you could call a consistent prayer life, a dependent prayer life, things like obedience start becoming natural for us because our hearts look so much like God's heart that we can't help but love. We can't help but have compassion. We can't help but share the good news of the gospel with those around us. And so the challenge is to get out of our apathy and perhaps to intentionally, intentionally be in regular communion with God, in regular conversation with Him. And that's the hardest part, isn't it? I mean, you just go through every single day and you get to the end of the day and you're like, oh, darn it, I didn't pray yet today. Because there's so much. There's so much noise. There's so much talking in our house, right? There's so much whatever it is, right? There's, there's just so much. But the invitation of God is to be, he wants to be a part of all of that. And so wherever you are, whatever you're doing, it's an invitation to make time, to spend time with the God of the universe. The one who, the one who saves us from our sins and rescues our soul for all eternity. The one who gave his life for us. I don't want to guilt anyone into this, but 
it's not too much to ask for a few minutes here and there, right? <laughs> like, if we truly believe in this massive transaction that takes place, wouldn't we want, I mean, if, if somebody in your life today gave you a million dollars, somebody in your life gave you a hundred million dollars right now, would you not make time for them on a regular basis to thank them? Right? Would you not make time to, to spend time with them? Would you not spend some of that money on them probably? Right? We serve a God who created us and who gave his life for us to redeem us so that he could be with us for all eternity. And he's inviting us into this relationship because not only does he want to be a part of our lives, but through us, he wants to be a part of other lives as well. He wants to see lost people be brought to him. And he wants it to happen through us. So I challenge you this week. I, or I don't know about your prayer life. I know where mine is, and it is subpar most of the time. Uh, and that is my own assertion of my own prayer life because it usually ends up being a morning and a night thing and, uh, and maybe sometimes when, when Jim's here during the week, right? Uh, it, right it, it, it becomes an afterthought. It totally does. And I'll admit that straight up, right? This is your pastor talking, and I'll admit that, I, that my prayer life tends to be an afterthought more often than not. And that's not okay for me. I'm not okay with that. But my challenge to you is an honest assessment of where your prayer life is. Self-assessment. And then to ask yourself the question, wherever it is, whatever it is, are you okay with that? Well, what needs to happen then to move closer, to gain more communion, to be in a, a growing prayer relationship with your God and your Savior. I'm going to spend a minute in silence. So get this. Actually, hold on. Before we pray, get this. So if you are in your small groups this week, you are going to engage in a prayer experience. This experience is intimidating and beautiful because you are going to be forced to be alone with God without devices, without all of your stuff, silent, listening, like an hour. When was the last time any of you could say that you literally sat in silence for an hour and you weren't asleep? Ice fishing, right? Hunting, hunting, okay. That's good. But seriously, And we're going to listen. Listen to what God is saying. How often do we spend time doing that too? We quiet our minds and just let the Spirit speak. It doesn't happen often. So where are you at in your prayer life? Let's just spend a moment listening. See what the Spirit says. Let's pray. Father, our ears are open. Your word has been read. And Father, in the quietness of this moment, we pray that you would speak. Help us to be attentive to what you are saying.
Lord, wherever we are in our lives today, or whatever conviction we may be feeling, Father, we pray, thankfully, uh, we, th- we thank you that your, your scriptures tell us, your word tells us that you are not a God who condemns us. And that conviction is a gift. A gift that prompts us towards renewed life and renewed action. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us the courage to move where you are telling us to move. Maybe it's the courage to make time in a very busy schedule. Maybe it's the courage to listen a little bit more than we talk and to be quiet in our very noisy lives. Father, whatever it is, wherever you're calling us to, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our relationship with you. We pray that you would continue the work that you have begun in us, that you would continue to shape and mold us. And Lord, as we uh, engage in deeper prayer, Lord, we pray that you would cover us, that you would give us a heart for the ministry and the mission that you have for us here in Hopkins. And Father, we pray that as, as we prepare to, uh, to go into this community uh, in the coming months, in the coming years, Father, that you would call us to prayer that you would go before us that you give us the eyes to see what you see here in Hopkins and the heart that you have for the people here Father we thank you for Jesus for the good news that we have the righteousness that you have given us as a gift. And Father, we pray that you would continue, continue to grow us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's fitting that today we are also coming to the table. As we, oh, first of all, as, as we had, does everybody get one of these? You know, there's this study that, that went out recently, well, not recently, I think it's actually several years ago now, um, but that one of the, the key things that is causing uh, the, the decline in the family is the busyness of life that keeps us away from one place, and that is the dinner table. And when I grew up, it didn't matter what was going on. When mom called you home for dinner, you came home for dinner, and the whole family sat around the table, right? This makes me sound like, I think it makes me sound old. Right? But oftentimes in our lives, we don't have the moment to stop for that anymore because of this, that, and the other thing. When we talk about communion, we talk about fellowship, we talk about growing relationships, the dinner table was one of those intentional connection points. And I don't think that's an accident that one of the greatest connection points that the church celebrates as a body is coming to the Lord's table. Because here, for whatever reason, and and I don't fully understand it either, but for whatever reason, God meets us here in a special way as we remember and celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection. And so today as we talk about a deeper relationship and a deeper communion, a deeper fellowship with our God, we come here to his table to dine with him. And these, right, I get it, right? If if you were having people over, you'd probably have a little bit more than cardboard wafers. But 
what these are is symbolic of something greater. They're symbolic of the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and what those things mean. They're also symbolic of the feast that we will have together around the Lord's table when he comes in his kingdom. So this is a special moment for us. And I just, right, it's the first Sunday of the month and it's what we always do. But don't, I want to challenge you this morning, don't make it what we always do. Perk up your ears, perk up your heart a little bit. And as we, as we commune together with Christ, be attentive to what he is saying. Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem. We begin to celebrate that in Lent in a week and a half. And from that point on, he was looking square at his death. He knew it was what he was going to do. And so as he's preparing these things and as he's teaching towards this and as he's discipling his followers, he brings them to a point where they have a meal together. This is the last thing that they would do together. And he has taught them so much. He teaches them to wash each other's feet, another symbolic gesture and and work of being a part of the body. He teaches them to love each other as he has loved them. As a symbol, as a sign for those around them that they knew Christ and were a part of his body. And then finally, he takes bread with his disciples. He gives thanks and he breaks it. He says, this is is my body which is given for you. When you eat it, remember me. I'm going to unpack that top little piece there a second. When he says remember me, he's not just saying, hey, remember that I was a person. He's saying remember what I came for, what I have taught you, what I have modeled for you. And then act it in your lives as well. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Be what you see, receive what you are. Take, eat, remember, believe. In the same way, knowing what he was about to experience, what he was about to suffer, he takes the cup and he pours it out. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And it is poured out for the sins of everyone. sins are washed away through faith in Christ Jesus. And this cup reminds us of what he has done. And also reminds us of what is available to those who don't know Christ yet. That their sins could be washed away too. And this isn't just for us. But that we are on mission with him to bring others into the family as well the power of the Holy Spirit. This cup is a new covenant in Christ's blood. Take, drink, remember, believe. Fathers, we have come to your table as we have dined with you today. We pray that you would speak through this. That you would nourish us. That you would empower us in our lives to live with you, to live for you, to be on mission with you. We pray that those around us would see and know 
through the love that you have called us to and that we show, through the life that we live, and through our God-glorifying turning to you in all things. We thank you for these gifts. And ultimately, for your son Jesus, who makes this all possible. We lift this time before you in Jesus' name. Amen.